Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. Another short video here on uh, a memory expansion. So this is like a third party, uh, no name brand expansion. You can see someone's reflowed the solder on here. It's a bit crusty. So I'll just get all these bits of solder off here um, before we do anything. There's a bit here where the battery's been removed. Look at that blob of solder there. Um, but yeah, what I'm gonna do is fit four more chips here because this has half a meg and it's got space here for another half a meg so I figured that you could use this with a 500 plus and get uh, you know two meg of chip ROM um, at least it looks that way now I don't know whether we'll have to do anything with these jumpers whether this is just to enable or disable it uh, or what but we'll, we'll give it a try anyway the worst happens it doesn't work and I take the chips back off um, I have some of these chips I think that should work on here they're not exactly the same uh, model as the ones that are on there I don't think but nevertheless this should work the ones I've got originally I got for eight of these this is a specific Atari ST model that has this type of chip on there you have four of these soldered on the motherboard and then there's four pads somewhere under the uh, near the where the, between the floppy drive and the power supply on the ST where you'll have four spaces there of those and that's what I got those for it's quite a rare board I think maybe primarily sold in France that particular revision but I did see one or two in the UK when I was in the trade, hence why I got the chips. Um, so I've got eight of those, like I say, four I can use on here and then I've got four spare for an ST or something if I ever need them. So all I'm going to do here is uh, use the solder sucker to remove these excess bits of solder really. And then we'll perhaps add some more solder if I need to. So I've tidied up all the solder points under there, you can see there's no big lumps of solder like there was before. I mean there's big peaks there but I'm not too worried about that. Um, so if we just flip that over, these are the chips. Uh, got a few Atari ST spares here. One, two, three, four. Yeah, so I've got enough to do another one of these at some point. Or I say upgrade an ST but I'm never going to use these for anything else so I may as well have a go at this. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think these are going to be the right ones. I think these are going to fit okay. Uh, the Dash 10s, 100 nanoseconds, so these should be fine, I think. Has that got a bit of solder on it? Yeah, it has. It's like that's already been on something in the past, actually. It's got me a little worried. But uh, nevertheless, yeah, I think these should do the job. So, like anything service matter, the hardest bit is just getting get a, getting it in place. And there's very little clearance, actually, to solder on these. It's not like the pads are very extended. They're almost like surface mount. Um, but we should, in theory, if we just get it in the right place, be able to just anchor one, you know, one point, make sure it's straight, uh, anchor the other side, and then just do a bit of drag, solder in across there with some flux, spring the solder in. Let's get. And I'm assuming this, yeah, this way around the notches there, like the pin one marker on the silk screen. If we just get a little bit of solder onto that end pad there, this has already been uh, soldered in the past, so this should be relatively easy to just heat and sit it there and then just inspect you can see it's not quite straight at the moment but the key is to just uh, you know inspect with magnification to make sure it's on the pads on both sides and then I can just uh, drag solder it show you a little bit of this I can't get much closer than that it's just a case with a little bit of solder uh, on the iron you've added flux in advance just heat each solder point like that and the solder just flows it's kind of like uh, it's got the same sort of join as a PLCC chip actually. It takes a little bit longer because the pads are a bit bigger and the pins on the IC are a bit bigger but hopefully you can see that's not too bad. And there we go, all complete. It's taken about 15 minutes or so that. Um, they're not all totally straight, you know, you can see the alignment's a little bit wonky there. It's quite hard to do that sort of thing uh, just by eye and stuff, you know. So just a bit of uh, final cleaning up here with the toothbrush. It's uh, not some of my finest uh, solder work this. And in fact the first chip, you'll see in a minute, we'll have a, give you a close up. The first chip kind of went a little bit uh, side on. It's not on perfectly straight compared to the other three. The other three I did a much better job on. So I nearly forgot, there are positions here for bypass caps for each of these. So I've got some uh, 100 nanofarad caps here and I'm going to fit one into each of those positions one block to the uh, holes on the underneath here and uh, we'll just fit these D1 
These ones have already got short legs because I think I've used these for testing things in the past. You know, the ones I've cut the legs off. So I may as well uh, use these. Now, just get these ones out of the way. I've got plenty more of these spare. So, one down, three to go. There we go, all four caps uh, soldered on there. I've cleaned the flux off from underneath. So, we're all done. Woohoo, it works, as you can see, two mag of chip. And uh, it's gone round a few times now, no errors, so I think that works. What's amazing is those chips have uh, been inside my collection for, I don't know, 30 years or something. Um, I finally found a use for them. So, finishing uh, touch here, I'll just stick myself a little reminder label on this that it is one megabyte. Uh, if we just carefully stick that there, it might not be perfectly straight, but you know what? That doesn't matter. So a quick look at another one while I'm here as well. I'm not going to waste too long on this, but you can see I took the four chips off. The legs are a little bit green. Uh, I did try four replacement chips in here. It still wasn't working. I thought it must be something to do with the traces. So I'm going to test the, uh, you can see these black traces here. It's not those. There is a short uh, going right down to this point here. The, the pins on the sockets, you can see green. I'll get some vinegar and a toothbrush. Clean, clean, clean. Uh, clean off with IPA. Um, yeah, it's a bit corroded around here. I'll clean some of these up. And then I noticed there's a switch here. So this is why it's detecting no RAM. There was a switch on at some point, someone's uh, you know, cut it off. So I'll remove these bits here. And uh, those two connections there are bridged already by the looks of things. Um, so I'll just try bridging the second, you know, the middle to the bottom pin there with a bit of solder. I might just do it on the underside. And then, you know, as I say, I'll clean this up, put the chips back in and just retest it super quick. So after cleaning the PCB up here, it still doesn't work, and I've tried different RAM in here, it still doesn't work. Can't see what might be the issue, so I'm figured it must be the sockets, you know, even the clean these, can you see, they're just awful. They just look awful. So, we'll uh, get the dissolver station onto this, uh, and I'm just going to remove and replace all of these, uh, all four sockets here. Uh, just make sure I've got the right connections here, so if we just uh, get that there. Yeah, should be super easy to get this off, I think. It's got lots of flux already on there, on the connection, so I don't need to add anything extra at this stage. So that's all the solder removed, we'll uh, just grab uh, a few pins like this and just do a bit of this, just to help snap them off. One or two of these might need a bit uh, more work because, you know, I don't know whether the, the solder's off on the other side properly. Yeah. Like that pin there, it looks like there's a bit of solder holding that on actually. You can try then just uh, see if you can uh, lever it a bit. If it doesn't feel like it's coming off easily, don't force it because obviously you will damage uh, the PCB. Yeah, it's off on one side. Yeah, there we go. So, no, no damage to the board. Uh, we just need to just clean up. I did test this trace here, can you see that one's all right? So, and there's very few traces, isn't there, going to these? So, maybe it's not that, maybe it's just the sockets. Maybe the sockets are just making an awful connection with the chip. There you go, four dirty, mangled sockets uh, off there. Uh, put those in the bin. Um, you can see the PCB's okay. We've got these traces here to you know clean up and stuff. Uh, one or two of the holes need unblocking. Uh, there's lots of flux and dirt and stuff on there, but anyway, I'll unblock the holes, um, clean up with IPA here now, and then put the sockets on. So I'll gently clean uh, under here with uh, a bit of IPA. This board has been cleaned already. So it took a while to get the first sockets into position actually, just because the uh, there was little, little bits of solder in some of the pins, so I had to you know, add more solder, use the uh, desolder station there again, um, and uh, you know, and then the hole was wide enough. You know, if you stick the board up to the light so you can see through it, you can see which holes look smaller and narrower than the others. Those ones still got a bit of solder inside the hole that needs to be removed. But uh, yeah, we'll make sure that's straight, it is, and the pin one notches at the bottom here, yeah, that's correct. Just solder the remaining points. So that's all four sockets uh, done with, I'm just removing the uh, flux there with a bit of IPA and a cotton bud. I'll uh, get a brush onto here and uh, have a bit of a brush brush uh, around. You know. A few bits of copper exposed there, just a little bit. There we go, that's looking pretty tidy. 
So we'll get the uh, chips back on and lo and behold you can see it's working but can you see we've got a different chip there? That chip was faulty and it was flaky. After I did the uh, the parts of the video you just seen I would say I used it for about six months and it, it was just a bit erratic occasionally. I would get weird things going on and I'd reseat the RAM and I'd put the RAM thing back in, you know, the expansion back in and it seemed all right for a bit and then it would start playing up again and ultimately it was that chip. All I did is just get some more of these uh, 414256s or whatever they are and uh, just swap them one at a time and as soon as I hit this one it started working. That was at a point where it wasn't working at all so yeah, the, one of the chips was a bit flaky. That's one of the things that corrosion can do. You get corrosion there and it's powered for a period of time with some corrosion and it damages some of the uh, and things and ultimately of course these chips can fail anyway you know they, they fail just by virtue of old age so you can see some fine uh, fixed wires on the top there this is all to do the real-time clock stuff uh, you can see I added a button cell um, I'm not sure any of the mods I did here I tinned up a trace there that was a bit uh, balked obviously marked it so it was fixed there was a couple of fixed wires under, need and under here for the, the real-time clock, probably for the mod actually rather than fixes, and a low voltage drop shot key there, you know, 0.3 volts. Um, so instead of the, because what the, the way these usually work is like 12 volts comes in, I think it comes through one of these diodes, it gets dropped by 0.7 of a volt, and then goes into the, the battery, and then the battery powers this, it's a CMOS device, so it can, you know, it's a VCC pin if you like, um, can go up to uh, 9 volts or more. So the positive side of my battery contacts here, I severed that, um, and the positive goes into that anode uh, of the diode, the cathode, goes directly to the real-time clock chip. So, you know, that's in summary how you do these kind of mods. You just need to obviously measure things on connectivity to work out what's going where. You can see, here's another one, same issue. Um, I think I fitted sockets on it. It needed a couple of fixed wires. There was uh, pads damaged on the top, which meant a capacitor couldn't fit there. So I fit a cap. Managed to fit the shock key here on this one. I probably cut a trace somewhere on the top side. Can't see where that is. Uh, but it's the same thing. Where you see these jumpers, you know, that one on the one meg I'll talk about in a second as well. It's the same thing. We've got a jumper. It's just to enable or disable it. It really is that simple. I'm not sure if this one has a jumper. No, it doesn't. Um, but often you'll see a jumper or a switch. Um, the contacts and things here are a bit flaky and the traces are a bit flaky. But you know what? It's dead reliable. It's rock solid again, fixed in 2020, being used for the last uh, 18 months or so on, I think the Rev6 actually this was plugged into. And of course I did the same mod to the board that we started off looking at in this video here. Real time clock uh, battery and we've got the low forward voltage shot key there, 0.3 volts. Uh, this one was a little bit easier to mod because there was, I think it was something like a 4K7 resistor there, which again comes from the 12 volts input, you know you can measure from the 12 volts connection up here, and it was just feeding the battery and the chip. So of course all I had to do is remove that resistor fit this here one way. I think I cut the uh, tw the 12 volts into that obviously because you don't want 12 volts interfering. I don't know how I did it but uh, yeah it's the same principle and as you can see solder points look really good on that. Kind of almost looks factory doesn't it? It certainly looks way better than it did at the start of the video and of course it works perfectly. You can see the one meg board in here at the moment on the A500 plus. Uh, this is the one from uh, Hell that came from RRG where I fixed loads of corrosion damage and stuff. It's got the Super Denise uh, from an A600 at the back there. The ROM switcher from Solid Core there, covered in a previous video as well. The SCSI 2SD were repaired in a previous video. And the A590, this is a different A590. It's got the ROMs from the one I fixed in a previous video there. So bear in mind, you're only going to get 2 mega chip with an 8375. There is a version of the 8372, but you wouldn't find it on here. You may find it in an 83000 or something like that. So the way this particular one was configured, as I say, you've got a bank here and a bank here. I think these are 4 bits each, so you've got like 4, 8, 4, 8. So that gives you your 16 bit data bus. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Uh, but it is interesting the way they split this way. So what I mean by that is, you know, the CAS, uh, one of the CAS signals goes to this pair, the other CAS signal goes to that pair. RAS, straight through. Uh, so if you wanted to upgrade something like this, uh, not necessarily one with SMD chips here, but like DIP chips, you just need to, you know, do some connectivity there and work out where the two CAS signals are going to. You're going to see the same thing. You're going to see 
half split one way, half split the other. So then all you need to do is piggyback them, because these are in parallel. Everything's in, more or less in parallel. Like if you look at the data bits on here, I think that top one there is one of them. It's uh, joined there, look. Yeah, and that one is joined here. And that one is joined here. And so on. Uh, but they're not joined to each other, because the, let's say you've got four separate data bits on each of these two. Uh, rows here if you like but the cas will be going to one half if you were then to piggyback them and stick the cas to the chip you've picked the opposite cas to the one you've piggybacked yeah so let's say you've got cas zero on the chip below cas one going to the chip on top uh, and then do the same on the other one cas one on the below cas zero on top i think in theory you'll upgrade it to one meg um, now obviously you'll need a 500 plus to work with it because it's got the additional uh, address decoding and stuff there to support that. Uh, you're stuck into a standard 500. I don't think it would see beyond the 512k. I think you need to do something different to stick it in, uh, you know, a slow RAM. And incidentally, those CAS connections they go to the 11th pins on here. So if I just uh, do from here, hang on. So it's either the top one or the bottom one. I forget which now. Yes, there we go. It's the 11th. It's the inner one. So if you count 11 pins down on the inside here, that's where you get the first CAS line. And as I say, that's going to be joined to these uh, two here. It's also going to be joined to, uh, to these two over here. No, it's those two. Yeah, those two there. And the thing that's key here is the data bits are not joined up this way. So whilst this block here is all going to that particular CAS pin, as you can see here, you've got upper and lower. So the data bits are different. You know, you've got upper data bits, lower data bits. That's how it's working with one CAS pin on a block of eight like that, you know, because you've got 16 bits there. Uh, and the opposite is true over this side here. And we go to the outer 11. Yeah, so you count 11 down on the outer edge, uh, sorry, that's 11, there. So it's the same here, this block on the right hand side, one, two, three, four. So you can have, you know, four bits on the lower, four bits on the upper. So I, as far as I can see, I could be wrong, you just need to like piggyback them, join up everything apart from the CAS signals and then just work out how to invert them based on the chip that's underneath it. So if the chip underneath is going to the lower, you know, CAS L signal, CAS lower, the chip on the top wants to go to CAS H and on the other block you want to do the opposite. So it really is that simple, I think. If you think I'm wrong, please post in the comments down below, but I may try it at some point, perhaps on another video, I'll get uh, another one of these cards that's got dip chips and we'll have a go at doing the piggyback approach to boost it up to one meg. So we do hope you found the video interesting. If you would like to support the channel, keep the channel going, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. Catch you in the next video.